excited to be here back in my hometown. Uh, I am Lisa Nicole Bell. I'm originally from Huntsville, and I now live in Los Angeles. The question I often get is, how did I end up in Los Angeles? Why did I leave Huntsville to go there? I went there because I wanted to work in the media and entertainment space. It was all I could think about when I lived here and when I was in high school, go generals, I went to Lee. And uh, my parents are here, two phenomenal people who uh, helped get me here. And when I wanted to work in that space, I wanted to do something positive. I didn't want to do it because I wanted to be seen or I wanted to be popular or be a star. I wanted to do it because I wanted to be phenomenal. My dad says I've never met a camera that I didn't like. Uh, I'll say that that is an accurate assessment, <laughs> but I wanted to use cameras to do something phenomenal. I took off and went to Los Angeles. I got there, and the roles that were available were hooker number three, or cashier number two, or a woman standing next to the truck. And I said, well, this is not what I came for. I don't feel like I'm creating a tremendous impact. And one night, I was sitting and contemplating my life and everything that I accomplished during the time I was in Los Angeles. And I had a moment of clarity where I realized that I was not maximizing my potential. I was able to see that media has a tremendous potential to change the world, and I wanted to be a part of that. So then the question became, well, how do I do that? How do I become a social change agent? How do I become an architect of positivity in the American society, but in society at large? That led me to start Inspired Life Media Group and now I have an entire army of people who work with me to create positive change using media. So what I want to talk to you today about is how you can use media to maximize your level of personal satisfaction and happiness. Because at the core of it, we all want to be happier. We use things like money, a certain job, a certain spouse, a certain home as measurements of that happiness, but ultimately, Happiness is something that starts inside of us and then radiates out. So that's what we're going to talk about today. CBSNews.com reports that in the 1970s, we were consuming roughly 500 media messages every day. Now, we are being exposed to as many as 5,000 media messages every day. 5,000. That is a lot of media, that's a lot of commercials, that's a lot of Facebooking, that's a lot of tweeting, that is a lot of yahooing, that is a lot of email, that is a lot of information coming into your psyche. If you were to keep what I call a media diary and look at how much media you consume every day, you'd probably be surprised just how many messages you consume. Even if you are checking your email, and you think that you're reading the message. There's a banner up here, there's something flashing over here, there's your phone going off, there's someone talking to you in the background, there's the magazine right here, there's the TV on, and there's you trying to send a tweet at the same time. So when we have this much information coming into our consciousness, our ability to discern what is important and what is not gets dulled. So we have to then create new systems for how we're able to determine what's important and what's not, what's relevant to our experience, what's not, what's going to move us closer to personal satisfaction, and what won't. The way we do that is mind filters. We're all experiencing life not as it is, but as we are. So I'm experiencing life as a woman, a woman of color, a woman who likes fruit snacks, a woman who has a Yorkie. These are all things that inform my experience of life. So if I say to you that you're fat, that you're ugly, that you're stupid, your decision to internalize that or not is going to come through a filter of what you believe about yourself and what you believe about the world. If your subconscious mind tells you that it's not true, that you're stupid, then you will reject what I've told you is false and that will not be an internalized message. However, if because there were 1,500 other messages that came in at the same time, and your filter was not up, and your senses were not sharp, you might ingest that message as being true, even if it's not. So then the question becomes, how do we then put ourselves in a position where we can maximize our personal satisfaction and our happiness if we know that we're being exposed to so many media messages, and we've got these mental filters that are filtering images and messages into our consciousness? Because we know that just because we have those filters, doesn't mean they're accurate. If you've ever been to the optometrist, as in this photo, 
then you've been on a machine where someone is changing the lenses, right, to make your vision clearer. And when they change the lens to make it less clear, you say, no, change it back. And then they change it back, and suddenly you see more clearly. The same thing happens with our consciousness and our awareness. When we're exposed to new ideas, suddenly we're seeing more clearly. And now that we know what that looks like, we don't want to go back to the fuzzy image anymore. Our life experience is very much the same way. So when we look at how we can cross the bridge into this space of saying, if I'm going to be ingesting this many messages, how can I maximize these messages so that they help me to achieve my goals of happiness and personal satisfaction? There are three primary ways that we can do that. The first is assumption testing. Periodically, for everything that you accept as true in your life and every belief that you hold, you need to remove the period and replace it with a question mark. The beliefs that we hold function as a GPS in our lives. They guide us, they tell us where to turn, they tell us where to get off and where to get on. They help us to determine where we're headed and where we're going. So that means that we have to be in a place where we're willing to say, for 20 years or 30 years, I believe this thing to be true. Is it actually true? How do I know? And once we've examined whether that thing is true, then we ask ourselves whether that thing is relevant to moving us closer to or further from the goals that we've set for ourselves. Because as children, we know that children are very gullible, they're very impressionable. If we tell them something, they will usually believe us if we're adults, right? We can tell them that the sky is red and they're like, I thought it was blue, but you're saying it's red, so okay, it's red, right? And they go and tell the next person, hey, the sky is red, and you're like, who told you that? That's false, right? And we're able to make that assignment, but if you believe that you're stupid, if you believe you're not smart enough to do what you wanna do, if you believe that you're stuck in some circumstance in your life, then those beliefs will affect the life that you create for yourself. It essentially becomes a box inside of which you live your entire life. So for every assumption that we have, everything that we believe to be true about ourselves and about the world, we have to periodically test the assumption. We also have to test the assumptions of things that other people tell us, in this case, the media. Because we believe that journalists and editors and publishers have our best interest at heart. We believe they're gonna tell us the truth. We believe that everyone is operating ethically, but most of us know that that's false. We know that there are some outlets that are more accurate than others. We know that some, act, some of these outlets have a certain slant on them. And so when we're looking at that, we're saying we need to test the assumptions that we're making about the information that we're getting from the media. And if someone makes a statement, no matter how confident they sound and how accurate it might sound, we have to take the time to say, is that actually true? The second thing is personal responsibility. I recently watched a documentary that was vilifying the media for a lot of the images that are being put out that are affecting girls and women in an adverse way. And we know that children, again, are very impressionable and we're saying, well, there has to be some accountability in the images that the media is putting out. But ultimately, we're responsible for the media that we consume and the media we decide to ingest. We can decide to watch The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, or we can decide to watch a show on entrepreneurship. We can decide to watch a church service, or we can decide to watch porn. We all have the ability to make that choice. And so rather than hoping and praying and crossing our fingers that one day the media will be accountable to us and be responsible and make decisions that align with us, we have to make the decision that we're going to be much more intentional about what it is that we are deciding to ingest and what we decide to do with the information once we ingest it. So personal responsibility, we know, applies to other aspects of our lives. When we look at our bodies and we say we need to eat well, we need to exercise consistently. When we look at our relationships and we say there's a, a bank account of every relationship, what you put in is what you get out. Well, the same is true for our minds and our experiences where media is concerned. And because media is very much like money and very much like food and that we all have to deal with it in some capacity, it's important that we are intentional about how we relate to media. The third piece is intelligent consumption. Intelligent consumption involves examining which media outlets share your ethos or your philosophy about life. 
Oftentimes, we're not looking at the source, but we're expecting the information that we receive from the source to somehow be consistent with what it is we believe and how we live our lives. However, we know that that often is, is not the case. So the question becomes, if you have to read a certain number of magazines, if you like to read magazines on a plane, if you like to read magazines while you're waiting, which magazines should you be reading? If you're gonna watch television to unwind at the end of the day, which TV shows should you be reading? Should you be watching? Should they be the shows that you just land on because you're flipping channels? Or should they be those that you've intentionally chosen to consume? When you make the decision to go to the movies, you are voting. Every dollar that you spend is a vote. Every hour that you spend watching television is a vote. Every time you consume something, you're voting. You're saying, I'm okay with this. I want more of this. Because we know that the box office numbers determine which movies get made. I am dealing with this as we speak in Hollywood. Whatever is popular, or whether it's the Kardashians, whether it's a film that we say, oh, why did they make that movie? It's awful. If we want to know why that movie got made, we need to look in the mirror. Because it's us. It's the decisions that we make. It's the votes that we make. Whenever we turn the TV on, whenever we decide to go see that film, whenever we buy that magazine with that celebrity on the cover. So intentional and intelligent consumption of media just means that you're taking the time to say, if media is going to be a part of my life, something that is inevitable and unavoidable, then which media am I actually going to consume and why? So Maslow has a hierarchy of needs that helps us to determine uh, how we reach what he calls self-actualization. The Food and Drug Administration has a pyramid that tells you how much of each food you should be eating. Well, Lisa Nicole Bell has a pyramid as well. She has a media pyramid. And this is designed to give you an idea of, of how much of each type of media you should be consuming. So uh, as we see, the largest portion is enrichment. And that means that it's something that is moving you closer to an intended goal. If you are a person who's decided there's something meaningful that you want to do with your life, then every time you make a decision, you're asking yourself, is this moving me closer to or further away from my stated goals? Because of that, it's necessary that you're constantly putting inputs into your system that are consistent with that and that are in line with that. Then we're looking at personal interests. Maybe you like to play golf. Golf is something that I'm partial to because I just started playing and I'm not that great yet. Maybe it's uh, golf, maybe it's dogs, maybe it's cooking, maybe it's travel, maybe it's investing. Whatever it is that you're personally interested in, you're taking the time to learn more about that. Then it's social networking. For many people, social networking is 50, 60, or 70% of it. Um, a lot of us are spending a lot more time on Facebook, on Twitter, on a lot of the social networking platforms. However, they do have their drawbacks. The question you have to ask yourself when you are using the social networking platforms is, again, is this moving me closer to or further away from some goal? Because it's very easy to drift in a space of comparing ourselves to other people, getting caught up in the dramas of a celebrity's life instead of consumed with the things that are truly important to us. Then we have the news. So studies have shown that people who are consuming large quantities of news are often depressed and they're often facing a lot of challenges in the way that they're handling things that come up in their lives. So the thing that we have to remember is that the circumstances in our lives and the events in our lives do not assign meaning to us. We assign meaning to them. And we have to be aware of that when we are watching and ingesting news. Obviously, it's important that we be aware of everything that's happening on our planet so that we can respond accordingly. But we do have to set boundaries on how much news we are consuming. Because sometimes we're being told that something horrific has happened. We have no control over that event. And yet we do have an emotional response to it. And then there's junk. We all like a little bit of junk, right? Everything in moderation. This is going to be your gossip magazines your reality shows, all the things that are your guilty pleasures that you don't want anyone else to know that you actually watch or do. That's your stuff at the top, the stuff that you don't want anyone to walk in and catch you doing. That's your junk, and we're minimizing that to 3%. So the pyramid then composes your media diet. It's the diet of stuff that you're actually consuming, and obviously this requires a greater level of consciousness than to be out in the world accepting everything that's thrown at you as true, and to have everything in the house on, to have all the televisions on, all the radios on, all the computers on, and the iPod going, and all of this information coming to our consciousness at 
wants. So I'll leave you with this. If you want to feed your dreams, you must begin by feeding your mind. Thank you.